Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice at Retzel and Andrus. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Jim Drake, also from Retzel and Andrus. Welcome, Jim. Hi, welcome. Hello. Today, we're going to be talking about lease issues. Jim frequently helps me when my doctors have real estate and lease related issues, uh, whether it's on a day to day basis or whether they're trying to do a transaction. So I thought it would be a great idea to talk about some of the frequent questions that we get um, to help those of you out there that may have these questions yourself. So why don't we start off by just kind of talking about what is one of the most common questions that you think our clients call to ask us about their leases? One of the big ones is doctors who have an empty space and want to sublease, want to allow another doctor to come in and use the space. And most leases require the landlord's consent to do that. So So they need to keep that in mind. So a lot of times I might have doctors and a good referral source wants to maybe just come in once a week and use the office. So they might set it up uh, on their own, so they might also they might be in violation of their lease if they didn't check it first. But yes. also for those of you listening out there, if you're doing healthcare and you're a doctor, or dentist, and you see any kind of federal patient, you also need to make sure that sublease arrangement complies with federal law. So it's not just something you can kind of set up, you know, uh, on the fly, kind of loose. Um, and and one other thing I might notice, I recently looked at a lease where it said if you wanted to sublease. Uh, even if it's just an office space, you actually need to provide a full set of financials to the yes. landlord. How yes. often do you see things like that? Well, it depends. I mean, if I know in advance, we will negotiate in the lease that the shit that the space sharing is allowed. So if we know that doctors want to do that, or if we know that it's common practice for that particular physician, we will negotiate in a new leases that they're allowed to share space, have office sharing arrangements. Um, as long as the sublease doesn't provide a, you know, the big concern of landlords is one, making sure that they're paid and two, making sure that you're not profiting off their space. So one of the issues is, you know, if it's merely like a space sharing arrangement and not a profit generating source, usually the landlord will say, okay. So, you know, you have the extra space, you need somebody to use it one day a week. You want to have the office open every day. So on Wednesday, you let somebody else do it. Usually the landlord's okay with that, so. Okay, that makes sense. Um, That's a pretty frequent arrangement for a lot of our doctors. So I kind of want them to realize that sometimes they come to us and they've already been doing that arrangement for a while and they have just some horribly written piece of paper that, that the landlord would never have approved of, yes. and it doesn't comply with the law. So to me, that's a really big deal. Um, another question that I pass on to you quite often is uh, clients who are having issues with um, things like air conditioning. And I was relating to a story I'd heard about some ob where their air conditioning was down. They were unable to see patients and they lost a lot of their inventory drugs or injections or whatever it is they had in their office. I guess for every different specialty, there might be different things in your office that you might lose. What can um, you know a dentist or a doctor or another tenant do, uh, and when are they out of luck under those kind of circumstances? Well, I mean, it, it, first of all, it depends. In some leases, the tenant is actually responsible for maintaining or repairing the the air conditioner. So, in those leases, the doctor himself is going to have to call the repair um, service and say, "Come on in here. The air conditioner is broken. You need to come in and fix it." In a circumstance where the landlord is responsible for it, um, the landlord is usually given a reasonable amount of time to get it repaired. Now, a week is not reasonable unless for some reason, like a, like a heat wave, they can't get somebody yet because they're not quite the emergency situation yet. Um, but usually the landlord, if the landlord's responsible, you gotta make sure the landlord knows right away that the air conditioner is broken and needs to get somebody to fix it. If you're responsible for it, you just gotta get somebody in there as quickly as you can, so. What kind of things do you think tenants are typically responsible for otherwise? What about uh, a leak from a unit above? Or what about 
a heating issue? Is it the same kind of thing? Like you have to look at your lease to see who's responsible or are there certain things where landlord is always gonna be responsible? No, the air conditioner is one that where the tenant is often responsible. The leak above, usually, that usually that's the landlord's issue um, because when it involves um, things happening outside of your unit, the landlord is usually responsible. The air conditioning is oftentimes wholly within your unit, and therefore the tenant is responsible. Um, Ice buildup outside, that's usually the landlord's buildup, you know, the, the, the making sure that the entryway is clear to come in, making sure the driveway is clean, the parking lot is cleared. Usually that's landlord, but if you have the entire building, that could be you. So that right. could be the tenant. So, so I think it's to... important. I think a lot of times people don't understand what they've actually agreed to in their lease, which can <laughs> be a real problem. So you and I sometimes deal, very often deal with transactions uh, mm -hmm. or practices where somebody might be buying a practice and taking over a lease or a lease has come up for renewal and that can present an opportunity to renegotiate a lease and so at that point sometimes you're telling people well your lease says this and that and they had really you know no idea and then the new person coming in does not want to agree to some of those terms so how successful do you think um, one can be in renegotiating a lease that we're hoping to take over or have renew at that point? And I don't know if this is too loaded a question, but what kinds of things do you think really need to be focused upon at that time? Okay, well, one, you know, if, if you have been a good tenant and the landlord is comfortable with you, you often have the ability to negotiate, renegotiate a lot when you come in. Now, you know, when you're a new tenant, landlord doesn't trust you, they're worried, they're nervous. You, you prove yourself, it's a lot easier to keep a good tenant than it is to go find a new good tenant. So at that point, you often have a lot of opportunity to renew, to, to renegotiate certain terms of the lease. Um, if you are a buyer, you're gonna have to prove, you're gonna, you're gonna have to give them financial information and make sure that the landlord accepts you as the new tenant. At that point, sometimes they are willing to renegotiate. Sometimes, like if there's a year lease, a landlord will want to extend the term. So you're able to negotiate based upon, a, you know, giving a new deal, getting a longer deal. Um, those issues there. The underlying terms of the lease, you're not, we're usually not as successful in negotiating. So, you know, go back to the landlord issue, to the, like the air conditioning issue. Um, if the original lease says the landlord, the tenant's responsible for the air conditioning repair, usually that's not something that we're gonna be able to renegotiate when we take over for a new tenant. Oh, we can try, but that's not usually one that will change. What will change will be a term, the rent amount. Um, if you're gonna extend the lease, you might be able to get some improvement allowance added. So th those are the issues that usually are we are able to negotiate. Do you think that most landlords are receptive to a broker coming in and trying to negotiate that? I know, you know, we've we've spoken to brokers on this podcast before, and I'm always curious because I know recently you've been working, um, you know, with some of my clients and their brokers. And do you get a sense that they um, they don't mind that, or that they would rather just hear from the lawyer or the tenant? Do you have any sense of how they feel about brokers? Well, I mean, if, if, the one concern that, that landlords have about brokers is the obligation to pay them. So, I, I, I mean, if I call, if 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 I'm dealing directly with the law, with the lawyer for the landlord, the landlord feels no concern about having to pay for the pay my fees. That's that's not going to happen. The broker, there's obviously concern that you know, will they have to pay a commission of the broker on? the renegotiation of the lease that's already in place. And right. so that is something that they are concerned with. Right, and, but I find brokers actually can be really effective on some of these real estate deals, um, you know, especially if the landlord is willing to pay. I think that's been our experience is they bring a lot of, you know, knowledge and, and relationships sometimes to the table and a lot of good ideas because they actually are seeing a really high volume of these type of negotiations going on. For new leases, absolutely. For new leases, the brokers actually be very, very helpful. 
in negotiating. You know, it's, it's the renewals where the landlords probably don't want to deal with the broker because they are, you know, why would they pay a commission on a lease that's already in place? Yeah, I get it. I guess every case is, you know, if you get a bad feeling or bad feedback when you have a broker call on your behalf, I guess you can always then have your lawyer kind of step in and, yeah. and handle it instead. Yeah. That's a great idea. But on new leases, brokers are, can be very, very helpful. Very helpful. Right. And that's been my experience as well. And, you know, we work with a few that do a really great job. I'm always just kind of curious, were they needed? Did they bring anything to the table? But it, I think they do. So, mm -hmm. I agree. All right. So a couple of other questions I have here. We recently had a client who um, whose landlord sold the building and they were forced to relocate. And I kind of wanted you to speak to that. I, I don't think most people realize that if a building is sold and they still have time left on their lease, that they can be uh, forced out. So can you speak a little bit to how that process would work? Sure. Well, one is that there's a lot of, and one situation I know of is where the land, the tenant did not realize that they had not fully complied with the lease. So therefore, the landlord had more leverage in terms of requiring them to move out or be able to negotiate a lesser deal. Um, also, too, sometimes your lease will allow a landlord to relocate you to another facility that they own if they want to close the building. So if, that, if that's the situation, um, sometimes you're forced to. Now, usually the landlord is going to pay for that, but sometimes the landlord can make you move. And um, obviously with a professional practice, that could be quite devastating because your facility might, you know, be something that you've really built out. It might be harder to find a, an equivalent facility where patients are as willing to come see you, um, you know. Usually the landlord has the right to move you. They also have the obligation to make sure that they give you and obviously, there you know, there's no perfect compare, perfect comparable. But you know, they they have the requirement to build out the new space, so the space is equivalent to what you had you had before. The rent has to be equivalent, and the space has to be, you know, of a similar nature, so that you're not going to lose patients. I mean, obviously, you know, if if you have a practice in downtown Chicago, they can't move you to Evanston. And expect you to have the same space, but if you're in a suburb, moving across a suburb or to a neighboring suburb, they usually can do. Right, and I guess you know they have to look at things like patient parking, uh, patient access, security features. It's very tough. That was, I mean, it's not a situation that comes up very often, but when it does, uh, you want to pay attention. Now, you know, all these things we're talking about are things that people sometimes will just sign a lease. They don't necessarily have somebody look it over or they may not really understand what they're signing, but it can make a really big difference when these events occur. Yes. Another situation you, you and I have dealt with before are things related to signage and hours of operation for a practice. Yes. Um, and that sometimes can be a big issue as well. Well, you know, in, in a, a particular in a space where um, you're, it's a, you know, multi-use multi, multi facility, you have retail and you have, physicians, the landlord is going to want to have foot traffic. So often the, the rules to the lease will say you need to be open, you know, six hours, eight hours a day, six days a week, which doesn't work for most physicians. So you have to be careful when you're negotiating a lease that you negotiate that time frame out. So you got to be really careful. And often the hours come up in the attached rules. So you have to make sure you, you carefully read the rules because most landlords don't have a problem if they're taking a physician saying, okay, five days a week is fine. I recognize you're not going to be open Saturday or Sunday. That's okay. Maybe it's six hours instead of eight hours. Usually they're able, you're able to negotiate that. You just have to make sure you know up front that it's there. Right. What about the opposite where you might be the only practice in a building that's mostly offices? Do you ever come across where they want access to be able to provide services, let's say on a Saturday, but the building is locked or the elevator is not working or there's no cleaning services? You know, I've seen that issue arise, but I'm not sure how common it is. It is common. You do have to negotiate off the difference. One issue also comes up is um, the off hours. 
a physician who wants to see patients before normal hours or after normal hours. And both of those become problematic if you don't deal with them up front. Um, heating and air conditioning. You, I, you see a lot of offices that say, we provide heating and air conditioning from eight till six, Monday through Friday. So you wanna make sure that if you can be open on Saturday, you have the air conditioning on or the ability to control the air conditioning so that it is on or the heat is on. Um, elevators. Again, up front, it, you have to let the building know. My hours are Monday through Friday, seven till four. Am I gonna have heating and air conditioning during those hours? Am I gonna have the access to the elevator during those hours? Right. And is the building going to be open for my patients during those hours? Right. I think those are great questions for professional practices to really think about because what you don't want is to get into a dispute with your landlord. I know during COVID, this was a big deal, obviously, off hours, um, they were staffed, you know, with fewer people, less security, less cleaning. Hopefully we don't see that happen again, but I think it also uh, made people aware of what was in their contract. Another issue related to that is signage. So a lot of times the people are just subleasing an office or they have a new associate working there, they tend to just do the signage on their own, right? They don't mm -hmm. necessarily talk to the landlord and we've had some disputes arise out of that. Do you see that very often or is that something that we really need to worry about when it comes to a lease? Well, it is when it comes, when it comes well, okay, there are two issues of signage. One is the outdoor sign, which a landlord is absolutely going to control. The other one is the inside sign. Um, you know, the, the sign on the door, making sure that the sign on the door reflects who the, who the new tenant, who the new, pay, who the new doctor is. And also the, and, and, and the, you know, when you walk into a building and you look at the, the, directory. the directory, making sure the directory properly reflects changes in personnel. Right, and I guess sometimes only certain larger size tenants get their names included in certain places. So if, yes. you know, making sure you understand where the name of your practice is going to be displayed mm -hmm. can be an issue as well. You may have assumed that it was gonna be in a certain, you know, more clearly labeled spot than it was <laughs> because you didn't turn out to be a big enough tenant yes. for that. It's right. absolutely right. So. All right. And so then the, the changing, of, the changing of, of doctors within the practice becomes a big deal too, because the directory, the, the building directory has to reflect everyone. So you make sure the landlord knows, okay, we brought in Dr. Drake, we need to add Dr. Drake to the directory. Right, keeping them updated, great. Yep. So one last question I have, and this is something we come across quite often when it comes to doing transactions, which is the assignability of a contract to a buyer. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of contracts will say you, you can't assign or sometimes they're not very clear on assignment. And certainly one of the biggest delays you and I experience in our transactions is getting the landlord to respond and, and give an okay to that assignment. So any advice on, on that topic? Um, well, one, when you negotiate new lease, there are certain types of assignments that are fairly common in the medical practice. So to try to negotiate up front that um, a change of you know, business structure, you, that, that's not gonna require consent. Um, a sale of the entire practice, you know, can we get up front the ability that as long as certain conditions are met, the assignment can occur without consent. Um, those are big ones. Um, the other one is, and the unfortunate one is, when the doctor is no longer able to practice. Uh, you know, he's disabled, he or she dies, able to either assign or terminate without huge penalties. And try to negotiate up front that, that you know, if the doctor is unable to practice for 90 days, can we terminate and pay, you know, like pay a, pay a reduced buyout instead of paying off the entire lease? And these are things we're often able to negotiate up front. Right. That makes sense. 
And of course, you know, if there's only one doctor in that particular practice, it's a very big issue. And a lot of times the original doctor is the uh, personal signatory on the lease. And when you bring on the associates and maybe partners, they don't necessarily, at least in my experience, always follow through on the paperwork and get those people added as personal guarantees. If you're the more senior doctor, obviously try and remember to get the people coming up to become signatories. But from a landlord perspective, if all they have is that senior guy and that's the one who's ill, disabled or, or leaving, um, you know, then the landlord's kind of in a, a stuck position. So, um, you know, that's a very tricky topic as well. well personal guarantee is, is an important issue to take into account on a renewal. Because oftentimes the personal guarantee is required to get a landlord comfortable. So when you renew, you're often able to negotiate removing the personal guarantee that's already there. So that becomes important, you know, just on an ongoing basis if there is a personal guarantee. Right. And sometimes the landlord won't necessarily, so you, you sell your practice, you move on, yep. the landlord's willing to assign it to the new buyer, but they're not willing to quite let you go, even though you're, you're retiring, you're moving out of town. For some period of time, they often want to keep the old tenant as a personal guarantor as well. Do you see that very often? I do. And, and you know, and sometimes if the buyer is clearly financially capable and financially has the financial wherewithal, the landlord is more willing to release the, um, right. the, the, original, the original tenant. Sometimes they they want to they want to wait a year or two years to make sure that they're comfortable with the new person. Right, and I guess one final thought before we wrap up here is the role of the bank in some of these transactions. I know that when a bank is loaning money to a buyer of a practice, they're looking for a commitment. Um, you know, sometimes it's a ten year lease or two five year leases. Although I've heard that maybe that's starting to change. Um, and they really want to know that wherever they're giving money, you know, that practice is not going to be destroyed by, you know, the landlord terminating a lease or, or not renewing a lease or something like that. Um, how flexible do you find the, um, you know, the lenders to be in those situations? Are they pretty strict about time frame, or what role do they play in that lease negotiation? Well, you know, I find that the lenders tend to be more flexible as you know it, there is there's got to be flexible on both part of the lender and the landlord in that case now again the landlord's main concern is making sure that they have a strong tenant for a given period of time so usually they're not uncomfortable if they know that there is a strong financial commitment behind it um, the bank has the same concern, um, and so that you know the bank wants to know if there's if there is a commitment for space. So usually we're able to work out something that makes sense for everybody, but you know it's something we have to deal with up front. Right. Yeah. And I I know the banks are are pretty strict. Like we often have to negotiate with the landlord and say we really literally can't do this deal, or with the Without. buyer and seller. This deal cannot be done unless we're able we to get five lease year or ten year lease. this length of time, right? And yes. I don't know. I heard a rumor that the lenders are going to start looking for longer terms. Even I don't know if that's true or not, but obviously that um, you know is something that we may start to see going forward. So well, the, the other concern on that though is the landlords being concerned about having too length of a lease now, where the inflation is higher than it had been. So that's something we haven't quite seen yet, but I'm expecting to see there being less, you know, more concern on the annual increase to take into account changes in inflation, which haven't been that high over the past several years. Well, I guess, you know, we're not talking about an office space where people are going to shrink their space and go in less. The one good thing, I guess, about physician practices, dental practices, people still go in and they still go in in person. So yep. hopefully from a landlord perspective, they want to do what they need to do to kind of preserve that great tenant, uh, yep. you know, that they have. So, um, all right. So any final thoughts, hot topics about questions that 
you know, you're getting asked by clients on a daily basis about leases that we haven't covered yet? Um, I think you've done a pretty good job of covering most of them, so. All right, perfect. Well, if you guys have any questions that come up to your mind about leases and you want to share them with us, please feel free to do so. You can reach out to Jim Drake or myself. And this has been the Health Law Hotspot. You can see some of our other podcasts at ralaw.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.